sure we don't.
radio stuff these days for, um, uh, like we, we did, well, my company did the, it just retired, but we did the, uh, the, the coach to coach radio system for the NFL. Um, they, they just switched over to LTE this year and they're not too happy about it, but um, they, they're losing their frequency, which is why they stopped using our radios. I, I heard they were using Commodore 64s. <laughs> uh, it was a little more sophisticated okay. than that, a little bit more. Um, but anyway, yeah, so that's, that's I, I'm still designing systems. Cool, yeah. cool. To his right is Kerry Sagety, who did the Amiga Genlock, uh, which was very cool. Think about the days of computers where suddenly it talked to your TV set and video sources and everything. Kerry was our comedian of the Harvard Lab, far funnier than any of anybody else I know. And also uh, an animal guru, so very cool to have you with us, Kerry. Thanks, Bill. And I have some stories about you I'd like to share. <laughs> I'm the storyteller. <laughs> to his right, Benny Pruden. Benny goes back to you. Woo, Benny Pruden. There's Albert. All right, very good. So Benny goes back to Commodore uh, cash registers. Did everything dealing with disk drives, what else have you? Uh, floppy disk. Um, uh, also, I did a disk controller for the C900. Okay. okay. Um, Z8000 for the rest of you guys. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and I was in the advanced R&D group where I had lots of little hobby projects that um, never really saw the light of day, except for one. Uh, yes. Uh, I went out with a team of people to uh, buy Amiga. Uh, right. Right. He, he purchased the Amiga. Yeah, you were the team, the sandbox team we called you that bought the Amiga or found it. Bob Russell was there too. Were you there? No. No, you didn't go? No. You and I, you and I went on to work at uh, Mars and we had glamorous work on payphone stuff. Oh, you talk about high tech shit. That was. <laughs> <laughs> you had to live till you sat up at New York Tail trying to figure out why this thing on 50 miles of cable resets. <laughs> but you fixed it, an all nighter, and it was up and running. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, Betty used to talk about what it was like to have an 8051 processor running in a Coke machine 200 yards down a dock in a thunderstorm. Oh, right. yeah. yeah. And, and that's your environment that he had to make work. Nice. So, to his right, Andy Finkel, uh, who was head of the games group when I got there, and I only recently learned that you went on to become head of the Omega software and everything. Tell, tell us more real quick. Yeah, I, I worked, I've been in software Commodore uh, VIC-20, Commodore 64, TED, uh, or which was named plus four later, LCD machine, a little on the C128, not much. Uh, I worked with Benny and under Martin Chavilsky in special projects. I also helped uh, coordinate the Amiga purchase uh, because that's what Martin did. Right. Um, and I uh, eventually went out to uh, work on software at Amiga itself with my team when we were about traded to uh, engineering in some sort of uh, weird deal. Um, nowadays, I work on wireless mesh networking with uh, Dave Maney and Fred Bowen and a couple of ex-Commodore people, as well as a whole bunch of people who didn't work at Commodore. And we are looking for people, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, Software guys, device drivers, Linux, <laughs> PBS, keep us in mind. So, to his right, now, now yeah. that's, this is how, by the way, they're going to reimburse me for the trip. <laughs> <laughs> To his right, Bob Russell. Uh, Bob, you're one of the original gangsters, is, uh, both you and Neil to your right. Um, what all did you work on? It, it's, it's so hard to find out because Bob is so quiet about what he works on, you almost have to beat it out of him. Well, when I got out there in uh, 79 at the original Commodore in Santa Clara, which was the second building they had, um, I worked on the original pet stuff, trying to clean up the basic and stuff like that, fix all the bugs that Bill Gates left in the basic. And uh, <laughs> then I did the graphics for the 8032 and the, and the new keyboard and stuff like that. So I go back to that area and worked on disk drives and debug disk drives. And then all the rest of the good engineers went off to work on the toy computer. And I, we got this board with a bunch of chips on it from Mal Charpentier and crew <laughs> from MOS and we're like, well, we're going to make a computer out of this, and you only need 4K of ROM, and I go, that's plenty, you can put everything into right. that. So I ended up basically shepherding that through without, you know, visiting engineers on and off when they're working on the computer they really wanted to, to do, so I did the original.
original 1001 in uh, Japan, and I kept really good notes, so Andy could later on, I think he did a lot of the programmer's reference guide, um, and that was my key thing, because I knew I couldn't figure out how to do everything, because I was totally out of ROM space. We didn't have enough RAM to do anything either in that computer. So, um, worked on that. Um, the one, unfortunately, responsible also for the super slow disk drive. We're going to be talking so, about that. Yes. So, um, <laughs> and it got even slower when I did it in the 64 because some Japanese board people took off traces. Um, so, then I went out. I was one of the two guys that moved from Santa Clara originally to the MOS facility because we were too expensive, also engineers, because we could walk across the street for $10,000 more. <laughs> Jack was tired of losing people, and I was tired of having a new manager every time I showed up at the office because I went on vacation and they'd actually gone through two rotations of managers. They had no idea who I was. So, um, But anyway, Luckily, I fell in with Al Sharpentier here, Bob Yanis with oversight from Charlie Winterbull, and we got to do the computer we really wanted to do, because we were kind of going, oh, business machine, we'll do, and we couldn't go faster, and we couldn't do better graphics, and we got to do whatever we wanted. We pretty much got protected, and a lot of clever people, hopefully I'm part of it, uh, I did kind of the software and integration, figured out how to put in a little blue chip hold it all together and how to modify the code from the VIC-20 so we could get it done in, what, six weeks? I think we worked on the chips longer than that because yeah, we weren't quite done. And we were quite done, but, um, so that's, yeah. that's the Commodore 64 part. And then I went on and did a bunch of other things, started being the Z8000 business machine because I wanted us to go business and was part of us trying to purchase Scilog before Basically, Exxon snapped it up right when we had the deal, but we had a great deal on chips, so we tried the longest time. To, that's why we had Z80s, and that's why we had Z8000s in various computers. Um, Very since, cool. since then, I've uh, I've done a lot of specialized projects. Always after I left Commodore, I did a lot of uh, really really interesting tablets, uh, touch sensitive. Stuff with neural networks, the handwriting recognition, built at the uh, DOS level because you had to be DOS compatible. Uh, I'll get Amiga. That's fun fun. Very cool. So to his right, Neil Harris. Neil just gave a talk earlier. You were part of the original Big 20 Commandos. I was. I was hired in January of uh, 1981 uh, as I think the fifth member of the Commando team, and Andy was the sixth. He joined a month later. Um, and I wrote the VIC-20 user manual and contributed to the uh, reference guides for the VIC-20 and C64. I wrote a few cassette games, and if you remember the cassette six-packs, I wrote the blackjack game and the Slither and Super Slither and helped with some other ones. Um, ended up running the Commodore Magazine group for a while, the Commodore Microcomputer and PowerPlay. Um, did a lot of sales support. Um, and you can go watch my YouTube video and see the rest of what I was up to at Commodore. Uh, left for Atari, so I know this is a Commodore panel, so I won't talk about that. But uh, went to Atari, went to work at the Genie Online Service, uh, went to Simutronics, an online game company. If you, anybody remembers Gemstone or Dragon Realms, online text-based fantasy role-playing games, we've got a player in the back. It's good. you will put my kids through college. And, uh, and now I'm, um, I'm at Amazon Web Services as of last month, so I still have no idea what's, how it all works, but I'll figure it out. And I'm also on the city council in Gaithersburg, Maryland, so uh, I've become a little bit more diplomatic in my later years than they remember me back then. Excellent, excellent. So to, to his right, Albert Sharpentier, and I'm, I'm going to real quick gush on, on, on some hero worship here. Because I've, I've told Mention uh, Pedal that I wouldn't have had a career without them, but I wouldn't have had my career without you. Because the Commodore 64 did what it did, opened the door, and a bunch of us walked through that door. So thank you very much. Albert Charpentier is the designer of the VIC-1, the VIC-2, the VIC-20. You did the initial design for and you did the design on the Commodore 64 with Bob Yannis' uh, assistance, right? I've got all that? Got Excellent. Yeah. Round of applause for Albert Charpentier. calculators. 
some chips, calculator chips. Then uh, I did RAM chips, uh, ROMs and RAMs. I did the ROM that actually went into the Atari uh, Asteroids game. Atari, a long time ago. That was 64K, and I needed 32K, and there were two bank switches, and I put that in for Atari. Bits, right? Yes, bits. <laughs> Not bytes. <laughs> no, 32K space in the 6502. <laughs> Um, so, yeah, they, they didn't have enough space for that, so we did that. And then, um, then my passion was video. Okay? I had to control a TV set, and I love video games. And so that's what led me to do the, the VIC-20, or the VIC-1 chip, okay? And we wanted to sell that to game companies. Nobody would take it us up on it, and even though it was a pretty cool chip. And Bob Yanez came in and said, gee, can I do my senior project on this is what you guys did. So he actually took that and took the board I had and put a little operating system in it and turned it into a computer. And then we showed that to Jack, and that was the toy computer that Bob was referring to. No, the toy was something different. Oh, was that yeah. different? Yours, uh, yours, came, yours came, the toy was already in. in oh, Solomon. I didn't that know was, that. That was okay. the super duper oh, okay. faster clock and all that oh, stuff. Okay. Not, 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 that your, not your economical stuff. <laughs> So anyway, that led to the VIC-20, and between that time, I start, I really saw the, the, the problems with the VIC-1 chip and not being really powerful enough to do the kind of video games that I like it to do. So that led to wanting to do the VIC-2, and that really then created a whole other product category with the sprites and, and things that I really said, wow, we could really do some good shit down with this. And, um, by that time, though, the VIC-20 was starting to sell, and so it really transitioned to the next generation video game, to the next generation computer. And I think that that's when you were you were involved with all of that. Right. I mean, well, we're going to do the Max, right? right. Yes. It was the game machine. Right. Yeah. 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 It was like, why just do a game machine? Let's let's do a computer. <laughs> yeah, let's right. Do something better. Yeah. So it was it was a it was a team of about eight of us in that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that's right. Yeah. We had, we had one guy that supported Bob and me in the lab. Right, yeah. We were busy cranking, cranking chips, chips out. And Dave, uh, Jim Redfield and Dave Diorio. Yeah. yeah. But so it was a small team of guys that were all yeah. dedicated to seeing this thing through. And it, at the moment, you don't know what you're doing. And all, all you're doing is having fun and saying, I want to do this. We were driven. And, and it turned out, and, and here we are 40 years later, and still celebrating with everybody on this team here. It was, it was a fun run. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I really enjoyed it. Thank you for inviting me. Absolutely, absolutely. So, if, if I were to try and start at the beginning, who, who's been here the longest? Who, who worked on the pet? Any, any, anybody here? You. I didn't work on the original. I was one year later. Right. I went to college with three of the engineers at Iowa State University, and I was an 80 80 guy, and those were 6502 dopes. <laughs> and, uh, but they hired me anyway. They invited me out the next year after the original pet came because at that time, I became a computer engineer and I had I ran the labs because there were no senior computer engineers. It was a new course, so I had pets in front of me and pets behind me in one of the labs I ran. And they brought me out to write the test software. And it, it was the type of thing where I wrote a test program to test the pets. It was so tough, it was failing everything because it was finding all the chip flaws and design flaws and stuff like that. So basically, production said, get this guy away from us. <laughs> I didn't write other software. <laughs> and so, kind of early on, my first time there was like uh, a lot of debugging, like the new disk drives. And uh, so, I, I knew how to, how to use the uh, in circuit emulation device, basically, that I can't remember what they called it. It was quite sophisticated, discrete 6502 emulation that you could single step through and it plugged into the chip socket for a 6502. So I got exposed to everything and that's why when all the other guys went off to do the fancy computer, I got assigned this little thing that came from MOS who didn't know what they were talking about at all. But <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we, were the, we were the pariahs, right? Well, <laughs> You did really good stuff when it worked. <laughs> 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 but that didn't push the envelope, right? <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>
So in 1978, I took a job at Mr. Calculator selling pens. And one of the first things we found was, um, you know, you could plug in a, an edge connector on the back and plug it into a speaker and amplifier and do a few pokes and play sound through the 6522 chip. But we did that with every new computer that came from Commodore because if the sound sounded terrible, then the 65, 6522 was bad and we use the chip holder and pull it out of the socket and plug in another one. So that was a slightly less sophisticated text than, test than what Bob was doing, but we had to do that with every computer. That's one of the, one, that's one of the chips they told me, <laughs> don't quit, quit testing that chip. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, we were pretty, we were sticklers, so we made sure that every computer that we sold at least had a good 6522, even if we had to plug several in before we got a good one. The, the, uh, the person that's not here with us uh, today or anymore, Chuck Peddle, who uh, kind of, he, he came from Motorola with an idea that became the 6502, Bill Mensch, Will Mathis, other people came with him, and then he's the father of the pet. I've got that part correct, right? So I don't remember what PET stands for. Uh, Chuck told me, but... Personal Electronic uh, Transaction. Backdoor, right? okay. So, yeah, yeah Chuck would... would right there. <laughs> but I don't remember, because Chuck was funny, he was talking about pet rocks were a thing back then too. No, it's not the pet rock. You know? <laughs> to this day, to, to the end of his life, Jack swears that it was because of the pet rock that they called it the pet, by the way. Yeah, so, yeah, that's the, part the rest of it. was made up later. Right, right. So, so if we start kind of from the beginning, go ahead, Benny. Uh, the cash register was a derivative of the, of the pet. Okay. You know, we just put stuff around it, put a printer and a cash drawer and stuff. It was a later design of the pet. And, and you came from Commodore, Texas. Right, I had a Commodore dealership in Louisiana. And we did a, a basic program and put a printer on top of it and a, and a cash drawer and turned it into a cash register. And all of a sudden, we're the largest distributor in the United States. And they're like, what's going on there? So they bought us and moved us to Dallas to, uh, right. to productize it. You, you were just talking earlier one day, suddenly, uh, 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 Tramel catches you and knows your name and everything and surprised the heck out of you? Or? Oh yeah, the, uh, it, it, it was later when I was at MOS, uh, I was working on what they called the, the cheap disc and the fast disc, and as, as I was walking the door, he, he broke off from the conversation he was having, and yeah, I wasn't hardly anybody, and he goes, hi Benny, he goes, how's that fast disc coming? The cheap disc, I think he called it the cheap, cheap disc. disc. Yeah. Yeah, it's Jack's tr uh, priorities, right? <laughs> but yeah, he, uh, he loved the engineers. Uh, but out of the cashier's division, he fired everybody one day, except for the engineers. Right, right. That was us. So, Albert, did he, did he love engineers? Did he love you? Oh, yeah. Well, he and I had a truce. I mean, we, we finally came to an agreement. There's one thing that I that he recognized that is that if he let me alone, I would make him money. Right. <laughs> <laughs> money that, that was a good place to start. Okay. Right. And um, I spent a lot of time with him in, in, from the big 20 years through the Commodore 60. And he um, was an interesting character, as, as we all know. Yes. And he, would, he would make it known, he would have the, you know, the we all heard the jack attacks, right? Where they, he'd yell at you. And, um, and he fired the receptionist when he walked through the door. <laughs> right, yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's he stealing my money, you know. <laughs> he was a, a bit, but again, he did like engineers because of the fact that it was something he recognized that, that was, if he allowed us to do what we had and, 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 and really understood who Happen. He would give us free reign, and that's one of the things that, that you really hear. <laughs> <laughs> okay, to set this shirt up, Jack had left and gone to Atari, and so we go to a CES show now with our, our the guy who used to run us is now head of Atari, and Andy's brother Steve came up with this T-shirt. It was the days of Ghostbusters, Jackbusters. Uh, didn't we get told not to wear our Jackbusters t-shirts? I think we were threatened that one. Yes. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> but Bill, I did see a picture of you making nice with Jack when he was on his deathbed. I think he was on his last months. And you were teasing him at some show on whatever. Oh, uh, 25th anniversary of the C64, which is 15 years ago now, right? Oh, wow. So, oh, you're talking about when I was going to take one for the team. Uh, the, so, I'll tell the story real quick. Uh, we're in the CES booth, and the phone rings. Remember landlines the, in, a, in a booth, right? They, they cost like $1,000 a day. I answer the phone, and the guy's like, go over to the Atari booth and check out their printer. Well, we had had a meeting.
meeting where they said, anybody going to the Atari booth is going to be fired. Like, they almost said, even you, Bill Hurt, you know, they were, they were going that way. So I'm like, I don't think that'd be a good idea. And the guy got, it was a marketing guy, by the way. He got belligerent with me and, and said, don't you know how I am? And I'm like, no, but okay, I'll go. So I walk over to the uh, Atari booth and down the step comes Jack Trammell with Sig Hartman, uh, as Shiraz Shifty, Tom Brightman, all of the all of these people. And I walked up and shook his hand and said, hey, you know, ex-employee. It was the first time I talked with Jack. And as Fred Bowen put it, as all these people are clustered around me, that's when you reach in and pull the pin on the grenade and take one to the team. You know, just one to five, good ratio, right? So that's the story you were talking about? Okay, I, I got you. Yeah, you said deathbed. Of course, Dave Haney's got a video called Deathbed Vigil. I don't know if any of you have seen that. Oh, yeah. Um, it's, it's free on YouTube. Yeah. Oh, cool. You can Google that if you haven't seen it. Yeah, that's, that's, um, I have a bunch of us are in it. Yeah. It was, uh, it was the last, uh, last few days of Commodore Westchester. Right. And the, the way I summarize people from Commodore is we're all a pretty sad group. Uh, you know, we had the world in our pocket at one time, and it just kind of, the way it went wasn't the way we would have wanted. Everybody knows the name Apple Note because they're still around, but uh, we're, nobody knows who we are anymore. So we appreciate y'all having us here. <laughs> <laughs> versus the 
Pacific 1001. And that, he wanted to sell a computer and scare the Japanese out of the U.S. market so they wouldn't come over. And that was the whole reason for the Pic 1001, why it was first. It was to keep the Japanese from introducing computers in the U.S. market. And he introduced the price kind of before he even knew <laughs> much about the Japanese market or the U.S. market. He just wanted to scare them to death so they wouldn't come in, and it, it worked. <laughs> you survived an incident with Jack Tramiel. You uh, told me about one time. You, uh, somebody had told you to countership a VIC-20. Do you remember the story? Yeah, it was early computers. They would put you on the airplane to take them to places. And I was told by management not to get on the airplane, instead to ship it, and it didn't show up for whatever reason. And Jack Tramiel came and ripped me in his office for, <laughs> oh, I don't know, half an hour it felt like. Uh, and everybody was like positive I was fired. And I said, I'm sorry, Mr. Tramiel, and I hope never do that mistake again. I'll do exactly what you tell me to. <laughs> Walked out, I was fine. <laughs> so yeah, the story I heard is he walked out and turned left instead of right to leave. He didn't go out the door. He went back to his desk and everybody's like, he's still with us. And we called him the golden boy after that because he had this glow. And, and it was useful. You, you could say, well, Bob said that uh, Jack said, and you could get away with almost anything because he, he had survived Jack. Yeah, Bob was one of the first people I knew at Commodore who had one of the Jack I win cards. Jack what? Jack, uh, a card. Uh, it says, Jack, I win. So in, in any argument with Bob, you could say, you know, you're arguing with him, and he'd pull out his Jack, I win card. And, <laughs> oh, <my God. laughs> and, and that's one reason we did cool stuff like the Commodore 64, is because it's like, uh, we're not going to go up against him. <laughs> right? right. That, was, that was true. Because once you, got, once you got Jack's ear, and you got his approval, you could only talk that one approval, and then you would always, I would go into accounting, and, and they would say, well, I need something done, and they would go, well, we've got to go through the process. I said, listen, I can call Jack now, or you can give it now. I, I have a JTI win card. And you go, okay. So you and I were talking, uh, I would talk about things that were urban legends, and we had an urban legend that you guys had said, you, you, you had this big chip, and you couldn't sell it. Nobody wanted to buy it, whichever one. But it's how Kalika, nobody, nobody looked at it. It's yeah. Crazy. And, and so you guys built a system to put it in and set it on. And, and the way we tell the urban legend is that you set it here on the table. Tell us about that. What was that yeah. system and what? Yeah, well, as I said earlier, Jack, uh, Bob Yanis took that as a project. I had built, I had a small computer working with 6502 that we were using as a demo for the game machine that we were trying to sell to people. And Bob took that. I was hiring him out of. Villanova at the time, right. and uh, he did that, he took it from a little operating system at a senior project. So when he's finished, this is May or June, he comes in and he has his, his senior project. So Charlie Winterbull, myself, we look at this thing and we're like, wow, this is pretty cool. And Jack is coming in a couple of weeks later, and we present Jack with this computer that Bob did as a senior project, showing him that, you know, the pipe and things like that. And that Jack just went, I want that, we're going to do that, right. and he called Chuck, and Chuck was pissed. <laughs> Chuck was in charge of the toy computer, that was his, he had a whole engineering group off in a separate building, and he was not happy with me. <laughs> and uh, he, uh, so, because Jack saw this, and was, wow, this is cheap, and this is something they can really do, and then they turned into the 1001 that, that started in Japan, and then became the big 20 and uh, it sort of was the demise of the whole pet thing at that point. Yeah. So how did the 64 happen? Because we heard, I heard almost a similar story to that then. Well, that was one where, okay, it, having no success at getting companies to buy chips, because I was in the chip division at the time. So my goal was to get silicon sold. And we had no success with the VIC-1 chip, even though during that time. So we started working on conceptually what a VIC-2 would be to make it a more powerful game machine. So during that time I was working on the VIC-2 chip and, and moving that forward, that's when the VIC-20 exploded in sales. So it became clear that, all right, the right answer is take this new game machine and let's turn it into a really powerful computer. And that's when the team came together, because it, 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 it sort of was just done. I mean, the fact was is that Shown that the Big 20 could be useful, and Jack just let us run. I mean, it really just happened over the fact that, oh, we're going to do this, and we 
said to Jack, we're going to do it. And he just said, keep going and go do it. Right. Make me money. Happen. Go do it. Yeah. Good question for Kevin Allen. So someone had asked earlier, um, and they weren't able to ask you, can you elaborate on the aborted attempts between the VIC-1 and the VIC-2? They say the 65-62 to 65-64. This, these chips were aborted to introduce interesting reasons. Do you remember anything about that? Which ones again? The 65-62 and the 65-64. Something between the VIC-1 and the VIC-2. Now, they're really, I mean, okay, there's, there's really the VIC-1, okay, and then there were a couple of versions. Because remember I had the, okay, where, where it comes from is that the original VIC-2 chip was running off the color clock, 3.5 times 2, okay, so up to 7. And it had, the problem with that is when you use the dot clock for the black and white, and the same version of that clock for color, they bleed together. Okay, so that was the original 6560. Okay, and then what happened was is that I was that only gave us about 36 characters on a line, I believe, and also we had the shimmer. If you put ones and zeros next to each other, it turned into a color. And you can see this actually on some of the Apple products. This, this <laughs> bleed. They, they call it color, yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's their color, right? Right, right. So it really annoyed me that we had this. Now, so there's a couple of little parlors. The first chip that we did came out of the fab in November. It didn't work. We quickly debugged it, and using a micro-inflator with little probes and so forth, we got that out to the fab. They worked over the Christmas vacation. We got that very early January. CES was a few days later. It worked. Off to CES, we go with this new chip. We're at that chip, and we're at the CES, and, and it was really, I didn't like what the shimmer problem that we were having, not even a shimmer problem, but it was just a, this bleed between the colors. Of it. So I get back, and we now, I, I make a change. Okay, that became, I think, a 60 by 62, the next version of the thing. And I went to an 8.1 megahertz clock in order to separate the black and white. Well, I didn't know something. If you have two separate crystals, they're going to beat against each other. And when we plugged it in, it came out of fab. It had to shimmer. And it was unbearable. I mean, right. you, you couldn't make it work. It just, the screen would just sit there like this because the dot clock and color clock were not synchronized. So there's a gentleman, remember Bob Simon? He was, Bob Simon was a guy that came out of Motorola that worked for their uh, uh, cable box division. And he knew about phase lock loops, which I didn't know about. Okay, so we put a phase lock loop in there and ran it off of the clock so that the color clock and the dot clock, we actually eliminated one crystal and we used to create the dot clock out of the color clock. And then that became the final version that went into production. Okay, okay, okay. And I will tell her one thing that we're, Jack was so mad at me for doing that because he said, you almost killed my company if you didn't get that to work. Yeah, <laughs> that's what you're saying. You're saying he was mad. Oh. Yeah, I got, I got, you talk, yeah, I got the jack attack on that one. <laughs> so, so was some of that dot crawl the reason why the later Commodore computers had separate luminance and chrominance to the monitor to, to kind of spruce up? Well, that was actually, a, that was actually a decision earlier on because of the fact that I, NTSC was certainly, using it on a, on a, on a home TV was painful. And I always knew that having separate chrominance and luminance would actually create a better screen, but you needed a monitor to do that. Right. So that was actually an original part of the specification to put that in, because, again, if you wanted a better screen than what your home TV could do. So that was really an early one desire to have that. So one, one of the things that I always think of with Commodore, the power we had, because we not only made the computer, we made the monitor. Well, the 64 did have a slight delay issue between the chroma and the luma. There was just a slight difference. And they fixed it in the monitor. So when you use the 1701 monitor, that's been tweaked to make a Commodore 64 look good. So, and, I mean, and why do that? Because we're Commodore. We can. You know? So, Benny, you talked about, well, I think it was you talked about a Tiger team at one time. Do you remember that? No. Uh, to fix, like, the sparkle on the 64? Well, that was a different issue. Right, right. But I'm, I'm kind of leading into that. Didn't you, were you a part of the Tiger team? Or? No. All right. Well, then I'll have to tell, but I thought it was you that told it to me. 
So after Albert's time, they got a team of people together to uh, address things like sparkle. Does anybody else know this, or am I just making this up? I know the sparkle problem. Nobody right, there. right. When they heated up, it was a right. problem. <laughs> so one of the things they did was the sparkle, you know, on a Commodore 64 screen, it's light blue characters on dark blue. And you would see these light blue sparkles all over the screen. So one of the things the Tiger team did was they made it so that in cells that didn't have a character, they would turn the foreground character, uh, color to dark blue. So now it's still sparkling, but it's sparkling dark blue on dark blue. So and it was a typical Commodore fix. I mean, it was just like a lot of it. Right? So, go, go ahead, yeah. I'm curious about something while I'm up here, I'm going to ask a question. So when we first got the big 20s to work on and create software uh, and the, as part of the launch team, uh, we thought this is the hottest computer in the market because literally if you try to remove a cartridge from the back of the computer, you would burn the heck out of your hand. <laughs> How did you guys fix that? What, I mean, it was really ridiculously hot. And what was done in order to cool it down? You talk about the big 20 or the 64? The big 20. So, but Bob Russell one day said to me, yeah, that was my, my fault. Is, is that true, Bob? You, you, the, not Bob. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> I made too many mistakes. <laughs> so I, I don't, I, the answer, I don't know what was done to fix the Big 20 heat problem. Other, uh, does anybody else know what they, they would use? Well, the, the, Vic, the Vic 20 always had the heat issue because we had to put that massive heat. Didn't system. we start a fire? We could. Um, those, those actually were, I had to go do fire investigations, okay? And those <laughs> almost always were people put the power supply underneath, like full length drapes to the floor. So they had no way to. It was their own fault from, then. Yeah, yeah. It, was, it wasn't even the computer that caught fire, it was the power the supply that caught yeah. fire and burned the drapes. So. Um, but no, it's it's like the original <coughs> 20 had just a little report I got from Alan Crew. Um, had a little heat sink and it would rot off the board after you ran it for you know, right. a couple days. So we put a super robust heat sink in and the only place we had space where okay. there was any ventilation in the case was where the cartridge <laughs> came and went. And we put a great big 3 amp you know, yeah. regulator yeah. on that yeah. thing. Yeah. And so you could pretty much use any sloppy power supply that the Japanese or anybody wanted to send over and it would regulate it. Well, you know, whatever, however sloppy that power supply was how much heat you generated. Right. Right. And uh, later on, I don't know how they solved it later on because I was like, 64 we had better solutions as far as power supplies. Uh, Probably better power supplies. Let's, let's talk about the better power supply. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right, who here knows the story of the Commodore 64 supply, the potting that's inside? Y'all always ask me this every, every show. <laughs> Who, who was there when they potted the Commodore 64 power supply? Bob, were you? There? I, I was there, but uh, you know, as long as it worked, that's all that I cared. <laughs> who, who came up with it? Was it Commodore Japan working with the vendor? That's what I always figured. I, I tell people it's to hide our sins. We slow down the act of catching fire, but eventually it catches up to it. It still has to get to the final temperature, and now you're just drying out the capacitors and everything that go with it and everything. But it, it, so the short answer is we did it because it appeared to work good enough for us to keep selling computers. Hanging away. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, we had some reliability problems back then. So, does anybody have any uh, uh, stories about like their first 64 or the first time they saw a Commodore computer? I want to get you guys to talk in here a little bit. Go ahead, Perry. First time I, can, I remember the tractor trailers full of the fail units because you couldn't debug them fast enough. The right. first time I saw that, I thought, holy shit. And it was like, oh my god, what, what are we going to do with these? And there was a debug team for a while that was going to try and figure out what was wrong with them. And I think we just sent a Dewey pile and it ended up in the Atlantic Ocean. So, Do you know what happened to those? Because there was like three or four tractor trailer loads. Yeah. Okay, anybody else have the tractor trailer story? Otherwise, I'll tell it. 
So we, the Commodore uh, uh, culture was to ship it for Christmas. I mean, and we shipped and shipped and shipped. And I, I can tell you stories about where skids of broken units just disappeared probably into shipping to be shipped. So we shipped to make our numbers for Christmas, we shipped to the 18 wheelers in the parking lot. And remember the, the big fields of eight, uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Right? oh yeah. And so they, we shipped them, they're still on the property, but we shipped them, right? <laughs> well, they go to open one of these one day and it's empty. Well, the uh, Commodore security guards had gone into business for themselves and were selling Commodore 64s oh. on the open market. So. <laughs> <laughs> the, my, the, my other story along those lines where the FBI got, because the FBI gets involved, right? The other one was the QA department um, was doing something where they were having units shipped to their house. And so that was their way of getting an amount of circulation. Well, I had made a deal with the QA department. I would go down there and give them data books, and they would give me IEEE 488 cables for the disk drives. So I go whistling down there one day with a, you know, my data books together, and the place is empty. It's been cleared out, and it's like FBI around. And I, I'm just like, no, nothing. I, I, I'm not here to exchange goods with the QA department. But who's got a story? I want to hear a story for somebody. Go ahead, Ben. So one of my favorite stories was I had uh, recently transferred uh, from Dallas up to uh, the MOS facility in, in Pennsylvania, and uh, Bob Russell calls me into his office, and he's going to teach me about uh, disk drive code. In particular, he had a little project he was working on that um, the 1540 uh, floppy disk for the VIC-20 was not compatible with the Commodore 64. Uh, and we had to slow down the clock so it was compatible. There was a uh, 40 microsecond DMA that occurred that would stop the microprocessor period, and we had to use a software clocking mechanism. So you know, we had to slow down the clock to I think it was like 60 microsecond. Yeah. But you know, Bob showed me exactly how to build this whole thing and um, and uh, how to back up the source code and, and make me promise for the production and stuff. So it was remarkably slowed down, but it worked. You know, it was flawless the first time he, he typed, you know, he built it, it worked and stuff. But from there, I went into Charlie Winterbull's office, who was my boss's boss's boss, who ran MOS technology. And I got on my hands and knees and begged him to not make us screw up the Commodore 64, because there was a fix uh, that Bob explained that we could do. Right. The, the, uh, the problem was with the 6522 and the 1541, the hardware shift register didn't work. Sorry, it had a glitch to it. And, um, but we could at least, when we were laying out the Commodore 64, it had 6526s that would work in the hardware shift register. And the, the fix was to you know, wire or the, the bit bang port to the clock zero port. Uh, and eventually, you know, we could change the software to Commodore 64 and have a, you know, a disk drive that ran eight times faster. And, but I, you said it was Japan that laid out the board and missed the trace because they thought... They painted over the traces. They took it off. They took the trace off because they thought there was you know, two traces going to the same line. Yeah, and two traces the same place. Two, two traces the same place did not fly with them and they made so many boards that Jack wouldn't let me change it. And one of the reasons I gave Betty that code to finish is I was working on this 6526 variant of the floppy drive and I had, I was working with uh, oh, the lab guy. Tim Bickey. Tim Bickey. I was working with Dave, and Dave, Dave was one of these guys that magically cut boards using his children or something. Because yeah. <laughs> you'd say, oh, we need this mod or whatever, and they'd show up and, you know, I'm not sure what slave labor was involved, but I had, that, I had the board, I designed the mod to the original one so we could use that 6526 with the correct traces, and then when they were allowed to, and I was like so mad, I think. I think I found the listing recently, but I'm pretty sure much I threw out the wow. prototype boards because it was like. Yeah. Okay, so the problem with the serial bus, so here's the answer to why is the serial bus slow? And then I want to ask Albert, you, Albert had a chance to fix it and was shot down too also, that's why I understand. But the 6526 was a hardware shift register. And why do a hardware shift register? We're Commodore, we make our own chips, we can do a hardware shift register. But we're also Commodore, we make our own chips, and we made the chip has a little problem. And that is, when it's an input, it's high speed. When we flip it to an output, that glitch that they said would occur, and everything, else, not everything, but the serial bus would lock up. And uh, uh, now, so the, the 
story I heard, the urban legend I heard is, Jack said, it'll be right here come Monday morning. It'll be fixed sitting here on my desk. Now, I don't know if that's true, but that was, you went in and fixed it in software, right? Well, I, I think I had at least a week or two. Okay. Uh, well, I heard weekend. Because uh, it's, it's the type of thing where I was, I went in and was talking to Bob Fairburn, who was the guy working on that side of the software, and was like, it, it totally locks up. I can't do anything. And he's like, oh, it's at 65, 20. well, you'd think you would have mentioned it before now. Right. <laughs> so, Jack shows up. It's like we're going into production in two weeks or whatever it was. So I need the final ROMs. I need all this stuff, you know, before we go into production. And that was why the slow serial bus came about because I needed something that worked. Right. And I had to test it. I was the only guy working there on the Big 20 at that point in time. So that's why it came up. And we had the beautiful opportunity to fix it. And it blew it. We, we were our own first <laughs> enemy. So bad. That was so yeah. frustrating. So it was a slow drive was really frustrating. But you were doing a fast disk drive interface, correct? I wanted to work on one, yes. Okay. That was one of the things we wanted to put in a chip because of the fact that I recognized that a slow disk is a really bad idea for a computer. <laughs> <laughs> Even though the cassette deck works really well, a slow disk <laughs> right, is really yeah, bad. It's, it's really a problem. And, and, and the fact is, is that the Apple was around and we didn't have the fast disk on the Apple that, that I really wanted to get that level of capability into the Commodore. But with these disk drives that we had and, and, and the boards, uh, I was, we said, I, that was shot down. That was, we were not allowed to do that. Oh, yeah, Charlie, who who shot down you down? Who, who outranked you in the company that well, could shoot was, you it down? Was, it was actually, I, I never got the full story who shot that down, whether it was somebody in manufacturing and all these disk drives. The story I got was that they had a ton of disk drives that they had built for the VIC-20, and they were sitting in the warehouse. And they weren't going to let me change them because of the fact that they had to get rid of these other drives. And that this, if I, we do this new drive, then this, all this stuff is going to go in the toilet. Okay. Okay. So that was the excuse I had. I never really got the real story as to whether that was the truth or not. That's what the builder down the okay. just, I, I wasn't sure if it was a marketing issue or, or it was an inventory issue. I never really was able to say. Well, the same thing happened to me because Charlie Little agreed to let me work on a fast disk. It would, it would plug into the cartridge slot. Yeah. It was much cheaper. Jack called it the cheap disc. <laughs> but other people called it the fast disc. Right. And I got the prototype working. Uh, and uh, it was much faster by having it plug into the cartridge slot. Uh, but it got killed. Yeah, it was odd. That, I mean, it was one of the things that was uh, the cultural problem is, is that I think most of us around here recognize that if you were building a computer that we wanted to be a better computer, and there was a group that sort of didn't understand that having a faster disk would make it a better yeah. computer. Yeah, it kind of frustrated from that perspective. But, uh, right. yeah, and, and it was, too. yeah, and yeah, so it's just an odd thing that uh, I don't, never understood who was behind that. I mean, I almost felt like it was Chuck Pedal making it so it wouldn't go. Making himself <laughs> down through, through Jack. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but, yeah, so that, that was one of the things that, that, that happened, but uh, how many? 27 million of them? Great. Yeah, Great. So this is okay. Yeah, go ahead, Dave. I was going to say that the fast disk and slow disk things just kept repeating, too, because there, there was a fast disk for the plus four that right. was never finished, never, never productized. Never sold, it was finished, um, never sold. And just to make things even, um, we had a slow disk for the Amiga 4000. Okay. So the, the normal Amiga 4000. 880k disk um, was controlled by Paula, and it was done with uh, a full track reads and writes and blitter decoding and everything. And um, for the, the 4000, we still had the same Paula chip and still had the same disk speed. So um, some magicians in, in uh, Japan came up with a with a drive we had asked for that would run at half speed. <laughs> so so uh, it would do twice the density, but. Um, no faster, so the effect was, of course, that it was slower. <laughs> and so I didn't know who, who knew that Amigas also had a slower disk. Um, but yeah, it was. I guess it was just common tradition. <laughs> yeah, yeah you, you heard it here from me. Uh, yeah, Apple did, did us. They, they beat us on that one. <laughs> yeah. So now 
I'm going to pick on Dave Esposito here a bit. Yeah, man. Did, now, did you work there at the same time as Albert? Al hired me. Yeah. Okay. Um, I, I can remember my interview. Um, I thought I was coming in to do PC boards. Um, Al introduced me to Mike Angelina. He's no longer with us. Uh, Mike's doing the interview and he takes me into the room. I see the three layout tables pushed together and this huge drawing on the, on the table. And I just stopped the interview and I said, Mike, I said, this is crazy. I said, I've done PC boards in school, on paper, you know, vellum. I said, this is an ink drawing, you know, it's huge. And he goes, that's what you're here for. We're going to teach you. So we, we continue on. I go back into the calendar room and I see this plot of ink, 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 starting to print out. And he goes, I said, you didn't draw that. He goes, you're learning already. <laughs> I got the job. 41 years later, I'm still doing layout. Um, but yeah, I learned a lot from Mike. He's, he was very good. He told me himself. Um, he did. He, he said he was the best. Um, but yeah. yeah. And that, that plotter, they would move it to, if you were unfortunate enough to sit near the plotter, you, it'd be like, oh, that's what you ever heard. <laughs> yeah. And then, of course, it would run out of ink. I was just getting ready to say. So our ink budget must have been crazy because we never wanted to reuse the ink pens. They were just, you know, little three inch, you know, drop them in, but you always wanted to put a new one in. You didn't want to get halfway through. You can't read right. it. It's yeah, never going to register it itself. Yeah, everything would be off. And that's how we used to check. I mean, now everything's digital. It's online. It's crazy how many. I can run 10 million gates for DRC and 20 minutes. DRC, what's yeah. that? And, and back then it was Something asses and elbows, right. what we called it. We'd do the printout, the, the one I saw during the interview. We did literally, someone would be up on the table, leaned over, ass in the air, elbows down, tracing out gates, and someone else would be looking at the schematic. Yep, okay, next. Call out. Yep. And, and call, call and check. Exactly. And that's how we did DRC, LBS. Right, yeah. right. By hand. By hand. I, I had heard that you all would kick off your shoes and crawl up on light tables. And somebody's like, you, you can't be on the light not, table. No, it was the drafting table. Not the light table. Okay. No, the light table is for playing pinochle. <laughs> <laughs> we, we would play pinochle at lunchtime. It was a big light table. Now, how do you do your data entry when you first... So, <coughs> as we're saying, this is a day when we're, it's all... I don't want to call it manual, but it feels... It manual. was manual. Yeah, no, it was. Manual. So, when I first started, yeah, nothing was... 100% on the computer. First of all, the Calvin stations were expensive. Yes, sir. So what they had was they had uh, what, two GDS-1 systems, which were just green. Data generals. Yeah. And then we had uh, two color stations and a uh, uh, digitalizer. Big light table. Anyway, so yeah, I was I was taught, you know, we're drawing them on gridded mylar. Well, and then one cell at a time. These days, I got millions of cells in libraries. but. And they would take it to the other room. Someone would digitize it in. They'd have that in the computer. You'd put a bunch of these together, and boom, now you have a data pad. Right. It was one cell at a time. But yeah, they were done by hand. And, and you were using the big plotter up to the side and then went to tablets? or how that? Well, one person was using a digitizer, but yeah. So in other words, we would do it by hand. You'd take it into the back room, and at the time it was Jackie. She was digitizing stuff in. Eventually, we could all digitize in, and then even after that, we started actually doing the layouts on the screen, I mean, at the station. But at the time, the machines were very slow, I mean, very slow. Right. Um, but yeah, it, it was possible. And then, of course, we moved on to the back system. We had, had things, well, incrementally. They got faster right. and faster, so you're able to do bigger chips, more. And then, of course, DRC became what ECAT, I think it was. Yeah. Uh, Dracula. We built better computers and make better CAD. Exactly, yeah. exactly. It's yeah, self perpetuating. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. we, I was going to say, we got VAXs then. You just pointed at Joe Mishko. Yeah. Joe was the system administrator of our VAXs. Um, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's, oh, yeah. It's, it's, you, you're who I took care of the PDPs, I took care of the VAXs, the Apollos, uh, you know, all of the, uh, and, and eventually uh, the sun, some sun workstations and, and thus and such. Uh, what, uh, what Bill learned is, uh, a Vax 8650 is probably the best hair dryer.
that could possibly exist. Bill, Bill would, I, I'd come in in the morning, right, I'm a, I, I was an early riser, we'd be out in there in the morning, Bill's in the bathroom splashing water all over saying, do I stink, Joe? Am I, I'm, I, I, you know, my girlfriend, and your girlfriend used to, used to come and steal you because you would never go home. So, uh, yeah, no, I, I, I taught him about the, uh, the, the Vax 8650 hairdryer. It works, it worked really well. Why, why did we have to reboot the hairdryer every day at lunch? <laughs> uh, basically because, because it really was not as great of a machine as... Okay. Uh, uh, it, the file got scattered or something. No, what, it, yeah, what ended up happening is it was, it was uh, resource leaks uh, because, right. they, you know, you, uh, there, were, there were always memory issues that would, that would come up. Do, do you remember the air conditioner fiasco? Uh, we, you mean the flooding of the air conditioner? No, we, I, th I think they found an air conditioner uh, sitting outside the junk pile and thought they'd put it in first and found out that it was sitting in the junk pile for a reason and they had to buy a real air conditioner. That, that's right, that's right. We had, we actually, we had the two air conditioning units in the computer room. Right. And uh, uh, you, you, you actually recognized that you could go over top of the door or underneath <laughs> the floor if you had to get in. And, and bounce the backs is, well, you know in the evenings, and uh, he would he would do that. I mean he and, and, and he'd say you know had to do it. Yeah, yeah. right. Well, well, I have a Headley story. I'm going to pick on you, Headley, and then I'm going to give you a chance to pick on me back if you want. So one one night I go in and the locked door to the VAX area where you guys kept all the the, the management terminal stuff. The door is laying on the floor. And I look in there, and in this red, dim glow, I see Headley at, at a terminal, and the, the tapes are going like this. And you were loading an adventure. Uh, you, you were trying to decrypt a, a game tape. Do you remember doing that? The, the story I remember about adventure was when we worked at the scale company, yes, I brought a story. printout of adventure, and we did our group meeting, and I sat there and said, I got this printout of adventure. We can type it in. And the boss was like, no. <laughs> <laughs> and, and. And then two days later, the boss calls me into his office and he's like, hey, you touched this. And he calls up the pit on this PDP-123 and it fingered me. It said I had touched the file and I had no information. And it turns out it was him. And <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. He went in and told the boss and said, no, man, it was me. It wasn't him. You know? So that was cool. But I had no recollection of yeah, it. So you had tapped out the, the hinges of the door. Yeah, it, uh, that's what I was just gonna uh, just gonna talk about. Uh, it, you know, I don't remember who disco discovered that the hinges were on the outside, <laughs> on the wrong it, side. Headley discovered. And, and, yeah, and you, 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 you knock the knock the pins and the hinges out and take the door off if you wanted to get into the computer room. So there it's laying there like just boom, and you hear ch -ching, ch -ching, ch -ching, come out. There's Headley. Like I don't even think you had your shirt on. You're just in there at the computer at like three in the morning. It was like, I was happy. He was. He was. He was in his happy space. Uh, you didn't feel like climbing over the wall. Uh, the, uh, so Bill did work for a while. What's that? You had a hair mattress under your yes under your desk. My my record was eleven days without leaving. But yeah. I, I took showers. That that made me different than some of the other people that stayed. And Joe would tell me if I smelled bad, and and then I would like react. But I would actually have to, they would turn off the hot water at night, and uh, I would have to get my bin and go over to the vice president's coffee machine and fill it with hot water from the <laughs> coffee machine. And I would go do it. And you did not want to walk in the bathroom at 6 in the morning, because I really was in there, you know, cleaning myself out of the sink. Absolutely. I, I, you know, we, we used to take bets as to whether George Robbins or you would go home first. Uh, George actually lived. He lived there. His, he yeah. lived under his desk. When they when they took uh, his uh, his driver's license away, he would ride his bicycle, uh, uh, you know, in in stay the week, and then ride at, uh, ride home. I took him home once because I felt really really sorry for him. And George lived in a train station. Yes. And and on the first floor of the train station were all of those Exxon. Uh, Unix Z9000 yeah. uh, you know, machines, and it was everywhere. And he, he just, he just, 
would sell them, you know, and, and little Unique's machines to take over the world. That's exactly right. That's what he, his intention was. So um, it's, it, we have ultimately got a, a photostatic plot, and, and we were in uh, hog heaven for a while, you know, as opposed to the pen plotter. And we had to learn the hard way. It, the plot would come out first all skewed. We had to learn to set the paper out so that the humidity would get to it and everything, you know, and, and it, because it was drying out as it was plotting, then it would stretch. So one night, and I used to preach, don't mess with stuff you shouldn't be messing with. So one night, I broke my own rule. I read, we ran out of red ink in the photostatic plotter, and these inks are just, these, these are indelible inks. So this, this, I went to do something with the red ink tube to either change it or something, and the tube popped off, and it's pulsing red ink like it's bleeding. <laughs> I, this stuff's going everywhere. And it gets on my jeans, and it gets on my hands, and I tracked it down the hallway to the bathroom, <laughs> stained the sink with this red ink. Everybody comes in the next day and thinks somebody got seriously injured on the job or killed, and they start going, where's Bill? <laughs> so, yeah, and I had to say, yes, I messed with the plotter. <laughs> that last bird bath was tough, wasn't it? Yeah. <laughs> And the same, I mean, I didn't know you could stain porcelain like that. Uh, who's got a story? Anybody want to jump in with one? I, I have a personal story, Phil. I, I came in one morning, and I wasn't part of the development of the 64, and I came in at, towards the end of the 128 before they shipped me out to Los Gatos to work on the Amiga. Bill was sitting at a prototype board with um, scope, one scope channel. And he's flailing his hands, cursing like a madman, and he's tired. Right? Now, you've got to admit, this guy is a role model from everybody that worked there. It's a commitment. If you haven't gotten his book, you should read it. It'll give you a selfish plug for your book. Thank you. But he, uh, he was on the wrong channel. I walked over to Scope, and he said, like, God damn, bro, I cannot find this. And you were working on memory share between Z80 and Z5, yeah, yeah, yeah. too. Right? And the scope was on channel two. I said, Bill, lay down for a while. Yes, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think I did. <laughs> I, I wasn't the only person who used my air mattress. I'd walk in the office and somebody would be asleep on the, on the off, in my own air mattress. So I'd be real quiet not to wake up the intruder in my office. So we talked about George Robbins a bit ago, who was the other person that had long hair and also stayed there. Anybody want to tell a George Robbins story or I'll tell the nesting story or anybody got one? George did the A500, by the way, so he did, was that the first Amiga? Did we call that the first Amiga? No. No? I, I don't know my Amiga. Amiga 1000. Amiga? Yeah. Oh, it, the Amiga 1000 was the first Amiga. Okay. That, was, that was the one that was largely was designed by Los, Los, in Los Gatos. Okay. Yeah, Dave Needle, in fact, um, when we were doing the C128, Dave Needle was out in Westchester, and he came by to look at the C128 board, I was like working with the 64,000 station or something. He comes by and I'm like, hi, and he's like, I want, I want to see what components you're using. So, so they were doing the last, the last of me, a motherboard. They want to make sure we're using, you know, that they were, that they were up to par on Commodore production or whatever. We you know, just so, but yeah, but the uh, the the 500 was uh, the second one, okay. and the first one done in Westchester. Right, right. That's, and that's that what was, I thought was the first. Yeah, yeah, that was the one where the the um, Bob Bob Welland and, and George Robbins had come up with this idea of sucking all the fat into Agnes. Okay. Um, which was all the there were buffers and gator uh, buffers and, and uh, PLDs pals around the, uh, the the main chip that dealt with moving the CPU bus across the. Um, uh, to the chip bus, okay. and it was it was fairly expensive just because PALs were expensive, and um, they actually had two solutions. They had done the Fat Agnes, but they were concerned about the size of the chip. That was always one of the biggest chips we had anyway. So we had a second chip called they were just called the Fat Chip in mind, which had all which was just a big glue chip that would have replaced, um, which would have re which would have been a standalone chip had Fat Agnes not worked. Yeah, but that was that was the whole that was the whole idea of making a making an Amiga that could that Commodore understood. Okay. Okay. And that could sell at those kind of prices too, and that was just a piece of it. I mean, George. I mean, uh, Jeff Porter did crazy stuff with 
getting prices lowered on floppy drives, getting prices lowered on power supplies, the whole, just the whole nine yards. There was every single piece of that machine was, was, cost, right. Right. was cost optimized. So George was the other one that stayed there long hours. And whereas I slept on an air mattress, George would sleep in a pile of bubble wrap under his desk. <laughs> and, and you'd go looking for George, and you'd see this bubble wrap with like an ankle sticking out of it, and you'd know you'd found him. And then later he'd be walking around and he'd have all these red, little red circles all over his face. <laughs> so you knew he had just woken up. Uh, George, oh, George also would not go to any meetings in the morning. Uh, it, he, he, the rule was if you were going to schedule any time with George, it had to be in the afternoon because he would work all through the night into the dark. And, and then when the sun would come up, just like a vampire, he would go hide under his, under his desk in the bubble wrap. Yeah, uh, and, and at some point George had George had actually optimized this where he moved, he built with the Herman Miller, Miller partitions. He built sort of a separate area that could be darkened, and that was that was that became the new that became an even better nest. Um, so that was that was with the door. Too. Yeah, that was with the door too. So he and, and he could he had some something hanging over the top or whatever, so even light didn't come in. Yeah, so so he could so you could look at his office and even under the desk you wouldn't see him because he'd be off in that room with the door shut. <laughs> he'd be behind me. But he was really committed. There was, oh, yeah. Yeah. There's one more. There's one more yeah. thing with. Uh, there's one more thing with uh, George. Uh, we had one of the computers, CBM Vax, which was not under the control of right. a system administrator. That was George's thing, and it was the uh, he was running Unix. And uh, Commodore didn't know it, but it was one of the main backbones it was. between uh, the U.S. and Europe. And George did that behind the back. Of, uh, nobody knew why the phone bills were so high, <laughs> except for George. But it was, it was carrying massive traffic at that time. Um, yeah. And if anyone, uh, anyone knows about that internet emulator, uh, there's an, in, an emulator of the internet at that time, which is still floating around. You can run it in your browser. George is still logged in. <laughs> uh, and you can actually chat. That's spooky. Yeah, it, it definitely is seeing his name there. Yeah, yeah, definitely one of our uh, lost brothers. George also taught me the whole A500 design. Uh, we, we, when I was, I was originally maybe going to take over the A500 because George had been the high-end guy. He had been doing the the Commodore 900 slash the 8000, and I was the 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 remaining senior C C128 guy after Bill left, and. Um, he sat down with me and taught me the. Went through, we went through the whole thing together, and then he's, you know, and, and basically he he didn't want to give up the 500 because that was his baby. So I ended up taking off the two, taking over the 2000, okay. having almost no idea what I was doing at that point. Um, and you know, and he he was he was there the whole time, you know, answering questions, helping me through. Um, we sat down and, like I mentioned before, we did the we came up with the video slot, just to make, you know, to, to offer some additional stuff you might be able to plug into the machine. Okay. Yeah. So, Carrie, uh, Carrie Sagety is a, I, I think of you as a broadcast engineer or an and, uh, yes. analog guru. NTSC, what's NTSC stand for? They're the same color twice or something. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and so, Carrie did the, the Genlock for the Amiga, and so that would have been the 1000 that you did that on, or? It what? was some version of it. We worked on Agnes, Daphne, and and I remember, we, you know, you talk about unrolling those, those sheets of the chip. And much like you, we did an all-nighter once because we were coming up on a show. And, of course, we wanted to we have the chips out there. And then we had a wouldn't it be nice uh, speech from Jay Miner, who at that time was running Amiga. Now, Jay, just a little history, Jay Miner designed all the Atari chips. It was, it was such an honor to meet him. But we, and we're looking at this big raster generator, whatever it was, and we're, we're figuring out where can I put in the color frequency of 3.58 megahertz, where can I force a reset of the horizontal scale, right, right. where can I force a reset of the vertical interval, and we kind of redesigned, I forget which chip it was, which did the timing. Uh, that, was, that, was, uh, that was Agnes. Agnes, yeah. And uh, it took like two days, right. and it popped out, and the, and the damn thing worked. But until you could get in there and really do those kind of handles into the system, Genlock didn't have a prayer. And, and Bill, I worked on the C64 trying to get that to Genlock. Tell him. <laughs> right? it, it, it's nice if the clocks are all synchronous. <laughs> <laughs> you know, fun things like dot call and, you know, yeah, it helps a lot. So I, I learned that when I
also. Yeah. <laughs> but, oh, Bill, Bill you, 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 you took, after I left, you took over the next generation right. of the Vickers ship, really, the, 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 the you created into a 48 pin. And how did that, how did you, how did that happen? Oh, uh, uh, <laughs> Jack Tramiel left. That was, that was <laughs> how it started. Yeah, after, yeah, after, after the plus four. And the Amiga was coming, but there was this time where nothing, we didn't have anything for CES. And uh, I got with Fred Bowen, that's how it started, and we started working on something. And we said, let's, let's make it C64 compatible. We, we had taken a ribbing on the plus four for incompatibility. And I, I was like, I, I had a woman tell me, it's like, I wrote software for over like nine months, and it won't run on your new computer. And my thought was, if we can give that back to the community, if I can, if we can give them more C64 compatibility on the next one, support the people that supported us, right? So that kind of was the idea behind it. And uh, we had something brand new to us. We had 48 pin chips that Dalbert didn't have. But it didn't exist. I mean, no. I don't love that 48 pin. So when we said, hey, we have this 48 pins we can put in, we put the big chip in there, and we started making it do 2 megahertz mode. We we added as much to it as we could without busting the die. We, you know, we just did it around the edges of it. And the reason why the 128 came to exist is nobody stopped us. Yeah, and that's it. That was the that was the best thing about Commodore. And Commodore right. Is that if you started with something, as long as you flew under the radar, and when it finally bubbled up, it was good enough, and it would go. But I mean, it, you had that freedom, and that's that was one of the things that I think made Commodore really fun to work at. Yes. You were yep. at that yeah. level that you go, okay, I want to go do this. And if you had the push to do it, nobody really stood in your way. It was a matter of standing up and doing it. It was fun. When, when we showed the 128, we were showing a 64 game, so it wasn't anything new. But the 64 is, you know, color, light, sound. And they're showing, we're showing a 128 doing it. It's half wire wrapped. And they're like, oh, this is great. Let's build it and stuff. So, but all I'm doing is showing the 64 game. But it impressed management so much that they, they said keep going on it. So, so then we didn't set out to put a Z80 in it. Uh, Z80 is another processor, right? We had a CPM cartridge that drew like an amp and a half when you plugged it in the 64, which meant the supply got hotter and would, the voltage would get lower. And when you plugged it in 128, we had two of these cartridges in, in, in R&D. And one didn't work, so I had a failure rate of 50%. One didn't work in the C128. I'm like, oh, this isn't going to work. So I also, I didn't like the fact I had to support an amp and a half. I didn't like the fact it didn't work. And we literally overnight said, let's move the Z80 out of the cartridge, put it on the board. We didn't tell manage about, management about it till the PC board was cut. Yeah. And now the Z80, we even made the Z80 do something so you couldn't just take it out and have it still boot. Right? So we, 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 and, and people ask, why didn't you make it a DOS machine? I never even saw a DOS machine at this time, right? But I had these Z80 cartridges I had to make work, and these, these cartridges took an amp, more than an amp, but uh, only 200 milliamps if I put it on the port, so CPM was born. How did you get involved in Because Vaughn here then made CPM work on the C128. Yeah. They, management did something right. They reached out to you guys yeah. and well, got you involved. Was, I was at Commodore working on miscellaneous projects. I think I initially was working for Bob. And one of the projects was they had this CPM cartridge for the 64. And I had implemented some CPM systems previous to that. So it was like, oh. And the problem was, I'm going to get a little technical here, but the program space called the TPA was small. And the max you could get was 56, 52K. And I think at Commodore it was more like 24 or 20. It was, it was low. It, you could run small programs, but if you had a big program, it wouldn't run. So one of the early things I did, and I don't think it ever even got released to the public, but I, the, the drivers to make the video work, the drivers to make the keyboard work, all that stuff, are the operating system was at the top, then the drivers came in, and then whatever was left was your, from the bottom up was your TPA. And transit program area. And so I had moved the code that makes all those things work. Instead of doing it in Z80 code, 
instead of mapping the screen in the Z80 code, I moved it over to the other processor. It's like, why? It's got its own memory space, so why limit what CPM can do? It can do it over there. So I ended up moving stuff over, and I think I ended up getting up to around 48K. The best you could do was 52K. And I got up to about 48K, and I guess people there saw it, and they, were, they liked what they saw. So I was a consultant at the time, and uh, I had gone to another assignment, and all of a sudden I get this phone call, and they wanted me to come back. Now, I lived up in Newtown area in Pennsylvania, and Commodore's way down in Westchester. It took me an hour and 15 minutes on my best days to get to work, and about the same to get home. And it's like, I don't want to do that again. Uh, it's, it's like, that's, that's a tough ride every day for months, and it was coming into the later part of the year, I think, when I got the call. And they said, well, would you work with us and, and help us get somebody else able to do this? You have not more knowledge than anybody else here on what's going on in this thing, and can you come down? So I said, oh, I'll do that. I'll come down for a week or a year, you know, a couple of days here and there. And they brought in a... I came down with one guy, and I think they had another guy that I never really met. They brought in, and they finally got back to me and said, you know, we, we tried these other guys, and, and nothing's working. Uh, what, what would it take to get you to do this? I said, well, if I don't have to come into the office every day, I'd be happy where I don't mind coming in when I need to, but I don't want to be doing that drive every day. So that was the arrangement. I started working on it at home, and that was before it. Was Nowadays, everybody can tell me. Back then, it was unheard of. I mean, this was unheard of territory. Nobody could work from home. So I basically, I had a CPM system that I had designed at another company that was working at home, and it had 8-inch disk drives on it. So when I first started, I said, well, I didn't have a 1541 working, so, and I basically, the first thing I did was did a UART to my system, and all the disk commands, I wrote BIOS so that if it wanted to block a disk, it would go over, it would transfer. Very similar to the way the 1541 works. Much faster, though. <laughs> <laughs> and so I, I got up the system within a couple days. I got a system up and running, and then I was off developing. So um, one, of the, one of the problems that existed back in the beginning was there were hundreds of different CPM systems. And every single one of them had a different disk drive, and every one of those disk drives had a different format. Some had 10 sectors, some had 11, some had 9, some had big sectors, some had little sectors, and then they'd go to 23, and then, and then they would, for speed, they would say, when you're writing, instead of going write one and then instantly write the next one, there was always this turnaround time to get things working. So what you start, they different vendors tried to get their their drive to be faster. Was they would skip sectors. So and some of them physically numbered them different, and some of them would actually just use the number. Oh, we're on one. The next the next strike you do is going to be the four, and then the one after that will be the seven, and then the next one, you know, on and on. And then they would interleave it around the disk. So anyway, it got real crazy. So that was probably one of the hardest parts of the whole job, was just managing all the different disk drives. The video interface wasn't, yeah, wasn't too bad. <laughs> um, that, I got the video up. Uh, there was all kinds of, back then there was uh, BT100, was a color terminal. Oh, yeah. And so it had color commands, and we had color on our screen. So I implemented a BT100 emulation so we could do that kind of stuff. There was a number of different things that I had implemented and put in the BIOS, and because I had two processors, I could ship load to the, the alien. I'm, I'm like Bob, I started in the 8080 world and moved into the 6502 world, um, and the 6502 just never really cut it, but it was really, <laughs> it was really a good, I don't want to do this, give it to him to do. <laughs> and it would save where you, so you could use that to save space in your code. And you could pass a function off. And oh, by the way, CPM had some things it was fast at, and the A60, 
8563? 8563. I, I can never keep track of the numbers of the products. So, well, and, and Vaughn didn't try and keep track of the, the rev number. Oh. So we had this 80 column chip for the C128. You may have heard of it. And, and so the way it worked is this, this, we, we're doing CPM now, but it, this was an opportunity because that meant we had 80 column code right away, WordStar would yeah. run, and we would, on day one of the C128, because of CPM, so now it's come full circle and we're going, we need CPM, oh, now we need the 80 column chip for it, which that thing was just, just a bear. Un un unlike Albert, they, the engineer didn't understand its use in the system, right? So he, we went through a lot of revs of the chip, and it was heat sensitive, and so what this guy did here was he learned a trick. You had an R3 chip that he liked, it was his favorite one, and he would take the works. He had a Mr. Popcorn hot air butter popcorn popper. He took the butter warmer dish out of it, would set an ice cube in it, perfect and, size for it, and set it on the chip. And then and he would get you get 20 minutes per ice cube. Yeah, yeah I'll just uh, have some ice cubes on the counter and I'd run it for a while and then I'd pop a new one in. When I start seeing the sparkle or the counters pop up in the wrong spot. And then just because I figured this is something they're gonna fix. It turned out it was a metastable data condition uh. that the guys in Texas had. I don't think they ever heard of it. I don't he, think they did, what it he, was. He did not try and fix metastability. Whenever you have two clocks, as, as Albert yeah, was talking about. Yeah, two clocks, they, they do this. And it, if, if you happen to hit it wrong, you don't have enough setup and hold time on your signal, and you get the wrong character right. that's latched in. It, 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 it doesn't know if it should be a one or a zero because it doesn't, it's not sure. And so you might get a, a wrong. It will misfire. Right. So the other, one of the other bugs, uh, if you heard us yesterday talking about a Texan register, because the engineer was from Texas, and they, he, we learned that if you wrote the register twice in a row, it would work better. That metastability would have less. So we called it the Texan write. We forgot to tell him about it, all right? <laughs> Meanwhile, we're on like Rev 6 or Rev 7 of this 8563, and he's back on Rev 3, where this bug doesn't even exist. As they rev this chip, Bugs got worse, not better. That was our clue. Something was going on. Yeah, yeah I just saw the face. Yes, yeah, it's supposed to get better every time. So we show up at CES show. Vaughn shows up. And he's like, well, I've been working on the R3 chip. And when we ran this code on the R5 or 6 or 7, whatever it was, it would leave characters behind. And it looked like the Matrix. And this is the 80s, and it's <laughs> crying. The terminal looks like it's crying as it scrolls. It's leaving characters behind. Oh, the, the way a screen scroll worked? Because there's no such thing as yes, an interrupt. Copy by software, not even DMA. Right? No, no, you, you didn't do that. You had to physically, if you did a scroll, you had to take the top, you know, the 24th, 23rd row, copy it down to the 24th, take the 22nd row, copy it down to the 20th. Anyway, you yeah, got what I'm saying. 256 and you had to do all of it. And so right. those would have rights that didn't occur. So as you were rippling it down, you left garbage behind. Yeah. And oh. So so it's the night of CES show. <coughs> Suddenly, it, it, a third of the booth is dedicated to CPM. Yeah. And so we show Vaughn what's wrong. We say we need a double write here. And Vaughn says that Vaughn did not have the computer with you to yeah. compile CPM, but he had a disk editor. So he sits down the night of Commodore CES, a Commodore disk editor, figures out the new commands and he uses a disk editor and writes them to the disk and in place of, he couldn't make the code get bigger or smaller and you had to re-hand calculate checksums and the sectors were recorded backwards in addition to the, the other thing was backwards. So he had to do all this. But if you know all this stuff, you just map it out and you do it. So You, do, you just do it. it, it has to, <laughs> so Bob <laughs> saves CES, basically. The, the simple solution was this routine that was here that was this long need to be this long. There wasn't enough space for it right there, but there was, at the end of the sector, there was some space that wasn't being used. So you put a jump instruction here and you put the code over here. You can't code in the new byte you need, but now you need to put it in the right spot, which just took a few minutes to figure out where, what the mapping, because you know what the mapping is, you just work out the mapping. He makes put it, it in, simple. And then you do, the, it was a simple checksum, not a, a CRC, which would have made it infinitely difficult. Right. So it was just summing up all the characters and putting the right number at the end, and so it, it probably took maybe 10, 15, maybe a half hour. But the first thing was understanding what the problem was, because right. that week, at first, it was like, what's going on? Nobody, you know. Nobody then, told you. Nobody yeah. told me, and then Bill looked at me and goes, I know what that is. We need a tech 
Texan rape. <laughs> what was that Texan rape? Oh, you haven't been around for a while, have you? Yeah. Because I was busy turning on the CPM as Bill was fixing all these problems and, and fighting these problems. Bill was soldering wires onto the cap of the chip and because that was connected to the substrate and, oh, yes. and putting a different bias voltage on it to shift it so that they run at the right speed. I grounded out the substrate, you know the number one notch? Yes. I soldered a wire to it to the BC, to the ground pin and I just grounded out the back bias generator and the chip worked better by grounding the substrate. And the chip designer was like you did what to my chip? <laughs> I fixed it. <laughs> it's yeah. it like mad at me because I'm abusing this chip that didn't work. You know? And if it shortened its life from 20 years down to a month, that was fine. We only needed to work for one weekend. <laughs> there was a lot of that, making, making it work for the show. Well, it was yeah. true yeah. Commodore fashion. And that's that's why I tell the Bond story. It was true Commodore soldier fashion. He just did it. Yeah, she heard him say, I just got <laughs> <laughs> That's it.